But welcome everybody to the Data Science Hangout. For anyone joining for the first time, this is an open space for the whole data science community, um, really to connect and chat about data science leadership, what's going on in the world of data science, and all the questions that you're facing. Um, so we want this to be a space where everybody can participate and we can hear from everyone. So there's multiple ways to ask questions. All the questions are, are audience led, so you could jump in live, put questions in the chat, or we also have a Slido link that Tyler will share in the chat in just a moment. Um, but with Slido, you can ask questions anonymously too. Um, and just a quick note that it will be recorded and shared up to YouTube for anybody who missed it as well. Um, but I also just wanna say thank you so much to everyone here uh, for building the Data Science Hangout with us this year. I can't believe that this is the last one for 2021. It, somehow five months have flown by so quickly. Um, but I'm so excited to be joined by my co-host for today, Ryan Garnett. And Ryan's a manager of data management insights and analytics at Greenshield Canada. And Ryan, I'd love to just kind of start things off by having you introduce yourself and share a bit about your team and the work you do. Totally, yeah, thank you. Well, first, let, let me say thank you for, for the opportunity. You know, uh, I secretly have been following you along <laughs> online like many other people, I'm sure, that follow along with a lot of the, the great stuff that you're doing. And, and shout out to everyone here, like our, our studio and our as a community itself is just fantastic, and I'm, I'm privileged to be part of that. A um, little bit about me, uh, I'm a bit of a weirdo. I'm not your stereotypical data science-y type of person. I actually come from a recreation background. So when I was a kid, I wanted to be Yogi the Bear. I wanted to work in a national park and do all that kind of stuff. So I went to school for outdoor recreation, parks and tourism and geography. That was kind of my thing in uh, Northwestern Ontario, show it to Lakehead University, uh, above Duluth for you Americans, so real, real north, even above Minneapolis. So that's where I really got introduced to kind of data and, and analytics and stuff like that, but from the geographic standpoint, using GIS for, for those of you who are, are spatial people. Um, so that kind of led me down my path, and, and then I did remote sensing, which is using satellite imagery, and I, I, I jumped into the world of data and analytics that way, not your data science 2010, 2012 kind of like uh, famously quoted uh, position. And if I may, I think we were doing data science really early in, in the uh, the geospatial world, you know, big, bigger, not big, but big data like satellite imagery and analysis. And we're doing like a lot of people kind of things there. So that really led me into it. And then as I, as I went through grad school and stuff like that, I, I wanted to transition out of being just a, a geo type of person. And I wanted to get more into analytics and, and building it that way and, and going that approach. And that happened when I was at the city of Toronto. Um, I started the, the data science kind of team and practice at the city of Toronto. Uh, it was still early days, 2015, 2016. And that's where I was like, okay, I got to do this myself. Like I need to start taking on those kinds of personas and characteristics and, and with the open data team. And that's when I, I started my art journey in uh, 2018. That's when I started to, to program and, and script and what's a function, like all those pieces. So I'm totally not your stereotypical person. I'm, I don't come from that computer science statistics background, uh, commerce or sorry, not commerce econ kind of piece. But I think as we start seeing data science evolve from that famous quote is the sexiest job of the 21st century, you know, in that, that area, we're starting to see that data science is migrating a little bit from a tech discipline that comes out of engineering, computer science, like statistics, into an objective approach to solve problems. And, and how do you solve problems when you need that domain knowledge? And that's where we're starting to see that real big shift in, in companies like our studio, because I'm always going to do a plug because I just think you guys are awesome, are really help democratizing that so that people can jump in at different levels, right? You don't have to have a PhD in machine learning or data science from Stanford University to start solving these problems objectively through um, a code-based approach and, and using best practices or standardizations of things. Like it really is being put in the hands of people and, and that really excites me. That really excites me. So uh, Rachel, as, as we spoke before, I, I can talk a lot, so I'm going to pause. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's awesome. Thank you for the intro. 
uh, in talking with you a few weeks ago too, I was so impressed by the like process your team has gone through to start to build up the analytics environment. And I think as we wait for a few questions to come in from everyone, that might be great to, to touch upon. Sure. Yeah, uh, thank you for putting me back on track. I'll, I'll appreciate you to be my, uh, my North Star. Um, so I joined Green Shield, and, and for those of you who may or may not know, Green Shield is a, a healthcare benefit provider in Canada, and we're actually a not-for-profit. So we're a social entrepreneur, like social kind of company, and we want to improve the health and life of of Canadians and we do a lot of social impact and that really drew me to to the organization and it was on geo so I was like great like like my whole my whole transformation so so I came in and and we were we were a, a fresh upstart kind of team so I joined in February they had started their team in 2018 kind of time frame and, and I was telling you before there's kind of two approaches that we generally see teams get built either you build like a strong engineering you harden up your your infrastructure and you build it out that that type of approach like really hardcore sometimes it's a bit of a theoretical like if you're taking a bunch of uh, graduate students or PhD students to build up your team or your how we have approached it was we want to show the value of analytics in an organization that has stereotypically not been data and digitally driven, like how, how we grew up as an organization in the healthcare providing space, that wasn't our, our number one forte. So how do we show the value to senior executives, board members, because we're a not-for-profit? So the approach that was taken, and I can't take any credit for it, uh, that was the previous team, like how they built their team was, let's have some domain experts that are super interested and let's have them play, I mean that in the, in the positive right way, play with data and start showing because they know the domain, they know things are really good with customers and in, in, our, in our other lines of business to be able to show how data can provide value. And, and that was great. So a lot of things were, were focused around POC and really quick and like that iterative kind of approach of let's show stuff quickly. And then they caught lightning in a bottle. <laughs> like they absolutely caught it. And it was like, yes, we have it. Now what do we do with it? It's that common piece. Like now that I have lightning, like what do I do with this bottle of lightning? And and for those of you who may be like, what is he talking about? Like Alexander Graham? No, no, no. I mean, now that you have interest and you have your leadership really like there's something here, how do you turn that into like production? How do you scale it? How do you replicate something that feels not replicatable? And that's that whole startup and POC kind of environment. So what we... What we did when I joined is like, well, let's take that approach and let's build on it, but let's build the foundation and let's kind of put some of those pieces in there. And, and foundation for from a production standpoint has quite a few components. And one of the things that I really wanted to harden up and and, and, and instill in, because we're we are an organization, a company, is like a product line approach. Like let's have some products. Products can be repeatable, so let's build that kind of culture in there. Let's make people's lives easy as possible, and let's always provide a space for exploration where people can try and where they can play and where, you know, we hear the buzzwordy kind of, of fail fast. I'm like, well, let's explore quick, and then that's kind of fail fast without using the F word that people are so terrified of. Like, no, no, no let's explore. Let's do it quick and see if there's anywhere to go. Um, as we got in, again, I'm going to plug, um, we were not a code first kind of organization. That's just not how we were. And that's, that's how like the approach that was set up because of domain, but they were really interested in going there. And we had a couple people who, um, had dabbled in, in R and, and were doing some things. And then we have, we have a superstar, Albert, uh, a software developer turned data science. So go us turning people over and he's our superstar and he's our, our, our big time data scientist. So we decided that we would like to have a stack and, and we chose our studio for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, so there was more than one person myself that could use it. So that was always a positive. People were open to it. Uh, I think our studio and R as approach um, with using tidy as, as that kind of grouping of packages, the tidy verse, allows for really easy uptake and swinging people up into like getting them moving forward. And then the platforms, I swear, I'm not doing this from a marketing sales, but the platform really allowed us to like build. So as we were like many organizations, not uh, data first, like that's not how we started. We didn't start in the internet age. We didn't start in the data science age. 
working with IT, we don't have like, here's your amazing 64 gig laptops. We're all working with like our standard laptops and it kind of minimized some of the things that we are able to do. So that's where, where I reflect back and, and like to your question, how do we get going? Making things easier. So we build like an infrastructure where people can log in and do things and share code differently and change that whole, that whole working approach so that you can explore and collaborate and literally build in time to educate. Right. So we have every couple of weeks we do called data ops, you know, trying to find buzzwords so people can say it, right? Like we're doing that and like introducing people on how to do things, whether that's like code based stuff in Git or building APIs and building functions and introducing them to our connect and work um, workbench and things like that. So we're really trying to build that piece always with the goal of building a product that serves our use cases. I'm sure I went way too long. No, that, that's really helpful. And I see Bruno just asked a great question around like understanding the challenges that you went through too. And Bruno, I'd, I'd love to have you jump in and, and ask that too. I sure can. Um, and I really just wanted to highlight your, your holiday outfit. Yeah, love it. Uh, Give us the shake, ring the bells. Nice. <laughs> So how difficult was it to transition to code-based data science? So it's it's something in the life of an organization. Uh, you, you you have to get stakeholder to like uh, believe in what you're pushing. So what was the most challenging part of that? And what kept you motivated? So you said you started, I think, 2018. So uh, our team started in 2018. I started in February 2021. Okay. So, so if I get your, your question, just to paraphrase, how, what were the challenges and how did we overcome that transition into a code base and how do we stay motivated within that piece? Yeah. Yeah, so to just to give a, like a context of where we started, Tableau and Alteryx were our big kind of like platforms or tool sets that we use. And as we know for, from some of us, those aren't really code, code first approaches, hence like the scrappy startup getting stuff done kind of approach. Um, how did I do it? I typically try to break things down into five questions and I want to own two. That's all. I just want to share stuff and the five questions in the world are who, what, where, why, when, and how. And I want to own the how and the who. Everyone else can have anything else. They can have the what, they can have the, the why. I like to collaborate when with people, but I want to know, how, I want to control how we do things and who gets to do stuff. Cause I think that's really how you can kind of drive stuff forward. So, that was really a good kind of transition and in, in a thought pattern of getting it in. So the goal was never like you are now code. Everyone throw your tools away. Everything you do has to jump in there and you better start line by line, pick off the books off your shelf. Like that wasn't the approach that, that, that really wasn't it at all. And from previous experience, doing similar kinds of approaches, I realized to get people on board and, and, and really eager and willing, I have to take on a lot of those costs. And I don't mean financially, like the cost of building it. So creating really easy to use, use cases, documentations, putting on training, uh, pointing people in the direction of amazing resources, which our community has so much for. So thank you. You've really made my, my life and journey so much easier. Uh, so that was a really helpful piece. Being open and, and transparent and vulnerable myself, I think was really um, less challenging for people because it's not like, oh my gosh, this per person is the world leader in that. How can we ever aspire? That's what it's supposed to look like. But no, I uh, I still Google how to do deep layer syntax every day. Like, like I still do. Um, ggplot is amazing, but I use a squiz to, to get the code to import it. Like, like, let's be honest, like you don't have to get to the very beginning, like the very end, like that linear piece and just getting people like go into it, like write it down and use it for yourself just to document your thoughts and getting them to transition. And like, I do not want you to write efficient code. Like, I don't, if you're trying to write efficient code today, I'm sorry, you're, you're wasting your time get the proof concept up, get those kind of thought patterns and move them along and really define where certain activities kind of stop. 
So for people who are like really aligned to business and they're really like domain experts, I'm not interested in those people having to feel that they have to optimize code to be the most efficient to run any platform. What I want them to know is solve those problems and then we'll lift and hand that off to another group of people who are really interested in optimization. They're really efficient at that so that people really understand what their journey can be and that if they become interested, there is other opportunities elsewhere. So really kind of showing a path of the forest through the trees was that approach. From a, how did we get it in? I just made a business case and I know it's, oh, you just make a business case. Yeah, well, I, I chose to talk about those laptops for a reason. So if you add up all the costs of getting a team $4,000 laptops, you have 15 people, you're talking about a really big machine. Like that's a lot of money. We're talking about $50,000. You can get, and we did get a really big server for half that cost. We have like dual processor, 16 cores, terabyte of RAM, uh, eight or 10 terabytes of hard drive space just to explore and do exploration on. That was financially cheaper than saying, hey, that eight gig laptop that you have, that everyone has, can't store memory. So you should really get them a 64. And that person actually needs 124. So I would like $60,000 in laptops. Like it just, that was more of a challenge. So we went a different approach and identified and, and really did a data-driven approach. Like what data sets do people generally use? How big are they? What are the types of questions that people are currently doing? What people want to do and what can or can we not ask? And some of our, like, we don't have the world's largest data, but we consistently work on 50 gig files and we're working on multiple of them. So we can't even put them in memory to do a summary. So you can start seeing how when you, when you break the problems down into like little kinds of chunks, we can build that case to transition over. And, and the last piece, because I, I know I always talk too much, um, is really listening to people and like, what can't you do? And I think going into that approach, um, you know, I like to be the Hulk. I'm always angry and I want to control that anger and use it for good. Um, is what, what is it that you can't do? Because most people want to do their job and they want to provide value and they want to be really awesome. So that's holding them back from making that leap and that step. So it's like, oh, those are your issues. Let me solve those with you. And then you just kind of break it forward. And then lightning in the bottle is now in another bottle. That's right. So I'll pause if you, if you have any other comments or follow-ups or if anyone wants to build. Frank, I see you were unmuted. I didn't know if you wanted to jump in. I see Bruno giving a thumbs up. <laughs> Not yet. I okay. have been unmuted the whole time, Rachel. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> uh, Amazing beer, I Frank. Love your beer. Hey, Ryan, uh, just yes. a, hey, my name's Javier. Just a quick question for you. Um, yes, please. I find myself, so there's, you know, Hadley has this principle of three where it's like, if you find yourself copying and pasting a function or something three times, like why not spend the time to optimize the code such that it could be three or 300, you know, iterations of the thing you're trying to do. Yeah, we I say two that, in our company. <laughs> okay, <laughs> like if you're yeah. gonna do it so, twice, so, yeah. So I find myself getting into these traps where like it takes me more time than I had planned because I'm trying to work out a function that could then be used for, you know, like future purposes um, as opposed to copying something like 10 times, like that would be a lot faster, right? And just yeah. changing the inputs, but setting it up nicely so that I could use it. I don't know. Do you have any feedback on that? Because I. I do totally. sometimes lose track on like, you know, am I spending too much time on this, you know, per iteration or whatever it is, you know, trying to yep. like finesse this function. A hundred percent. And like, you're so on point with the realities of a team. And then when you're up scaling and you're moving and you're evolving into like that kind of piece. And, and we don't talk about that so much as a community. And I'm so glad that you brought it up because I experienced that myself. So I, and I'm going to literally answer your question. I'm just going to preface it in there, given a little bit of what's going on. That was me, like in 2018. Like I had, I had worked in like software companies, so I know what's possible. I helped design them. I helped build them and put that together. I didn't know how to read in a dang file alone doing anything else. So we have this, this illusion and image of what 
code base should be. And that's a really big step. And typically we educate people to go linearly, right? Like start here and here, and now you're perfect. And, and, and now you're awesome with the assumption that everyone can learn that way. And, and in your space and in my space, we're, we're adults, right? We were adult edu uh, learners and that's not how we learn. So going through that and like working with people and then like previous uh, places, I put people to school at 60 years old and got them starting to code and like learning and teaching that kind of stuff. So you see that and they're always want to get to that part. What I've, what I've recently done is kind of break stuff out into like two kind of areas. One was taking something that I heard at a previous job, um, the TRL, the technology readiness level. I'm only saying that because what it allowed me to do is take that and break it down into little tiny segments of chunks. So the TRL, the technology readiness level is, was built by NASA, I believe, to kind of say how mature is, an, is a software product so that you know like how long and now you can commercialize it like from working with the government. It was really not awesome for data science and data analytics. So it was missing a whole bunch of pieces. So I kind of like, how does that work for us? Because we were building a startup, we were building software and working with the government and they use that kind of piece. And it really helped me understand your question, right? It's like, okay, you start at one and you go to nine and then there's a bunch of stuff in between. Where at what point would you think that something is like a product? a software product that's working, you know, it's all functional based, it's calling, there's no hard code kind of stuff. Well, if you think of that as like seven, eight, nine, like really far down the line, would we assume that it would start at one? Would you start building that function at one? Probably that's a good point. Yeah, that's right? a really good way to look at it. Right. Hmm. Right. So, so if you take that kind of thought, like the design, build, test, sprint kind of thought pattern is like one from TRL is literally my napkin in drawing. So we go back to like first year comp side, do your pseudocode. It's the most valuable. Like, okay, yeah, it's really valuable, but we jump into syntax now. We kind of do it that way. So that's kind of like where I start to like see like, okay, yeah, even for myself, I, I need to stop do that, doing that. But then also for the team, I want people to get as close to a hundred, but never over 80 because diminishing returns happens in that 80 to 100, and I'm just using loose numbers, right? And that 80 to 100. So what value does someone early on in their stages of their career have spending multiple extra time to efficiently do something than solving new problems? So let's take two roles. Someone who's a domain expert and you pick your domain, like you know so much, but your code, optimization and programming like that thing is more lower than the video game level, right? You're, you're more in that junior, you're not the expert. And then you have the opposite. You have a, someone who's like, uh, I could code anything, right? You give me two sticks and I'll code it together. Couldn't tell you anything about that business. Where do you want to put them? So you want that person to solve the problem and hand it off. And that's how we've organized our team. We've organized our team to be data science and then data engineering. And for that reason, it's like, we're going to work together into that like five, six, seven overlap so that people are solving problems and handing them off. But there's that transitionary piece over there for a couple of reasons so that the people who take code don't mess up, but also to train back. Hey, we're going to do a code review course. What are you doing here? Oh, you're doing that. Can I show you how you could do that more optimally next time? So they're starting to see how that changes in that education. And then through those experiences, we start seeing how often things are happening and we start building our own packages and code bases for our custom pieces so that it's like you. I want to use this so I could just put in a couple variables and it'll do whatever it is I want. It's not coded to a data set or to a value or a thing like super efficiently optimal. But by going through the problems and understanding how often things come up, you really start to understand what you should build. So you're building a bit of a priority matrix or a priority process of what you should build. And either you tackle it as your own side project, I'm like, man, I'm going to figure this out. I'm going to sep separate some time to kind of do it, but it's not going to hinder me from progressing into like my my job, my project, my like solving the problem. And then when I get to a point, I'm going to work with my, my colleagues over here who are like, they're wizards. 
and they got the, the magic wand and they can bippity boppity boo and just slam, oh, it's finished, right? And then because it's a shared code based environment, we can look at it and then we put it into like a knowledge sharing documentation in our Git. Like we're using DevOps just because we're a, like we're a Microsoft shop. So it's a lot of those learnings, like really investing in data literacy, probably the unsung least sexiest part of this whole domain. It's like really putting it there so that we can get people further and further and further up that ladder and they can make that choice, which if they want to jump ladders. And, you know, we have a person, a, I won't say his name because he's not on here and I hadn't asked, but this person started at zero. They're really good at SQL. It's like, yeah, I can, I can pull some stuff out. Introduce this person to R in a month, doing a whole bunch of stuff, give him a few pointers. Now he's publishing APIs, right? Like you can see that going through. It's like, don't try to write a function. I'm going to get mad if you try to write a function first, let's walk through and see if it gives you the answer and then let's start reverse engineering it and like optimizing it. And then tell me, let's put it in our board, what utilities we should be building to be making that happen so you're not hard coding anymore. And then that's where that learning is starting to happen and going but really importantly, giving that space and the opportunity to do it. I don't know if I went too far on a tangent there for you. Um, if you want to like streamline me into something that we know that, that this is all also, I took a few notes here. So thank you. <laughs> oh, no problem. Thank you, Ryan. I, I see Jake, you raised your hand as well for a question. Would you want to jump in? Can you hear us? Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> no worries. Uh, I had lowered it because you all started to talk about uh, code review, which is what I was, um, was thinking about. Um, I work at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and we, we really encourage code review early and often. And I think that really just helps build the muscle memory so that the efficient practices um, just become something that folks do more often. Like, like we, we don't want like it to get too far ahead and then have to refactor a whole bunch of code. Because what happens is folks, folks are like too far along and then get too much feedback and are like, that's great. I don't have time for it because like they're like ready to move on with the next step. So instead we start, we, we suggest like, start early and then like be pairing with the code reviewer kind of through the whole process. And, that's right. uh, and I, th I think that's really helped um, like both improve the proficiency on the team, but also reduce like this technical debt that, that kind of grows if it goes uh, too long. So I just want to put that up. For sure. Thank you. If I can add something to that, some other pieces that we find helpful is like if, if you're using like an issue board or any like a, a sprint session like Kanban, we also ask people to identify who they want to review so that you're paired up early on when things happen. And we've built a style guide so people know what it looks like. So, okay, I'm about to start doing stuff. This is kind of our standard, how we look at things. And then um, we put in effort to create a, a notebook markdown template so that it forces people to think through the problems and like put it in together so that they have it. And then it's the starting of a documentation for that code review and then they submit it up. And then, so it's like, okay, that, that code block, great. That's that's actually your function. Like you were doing some exploratory, you were doing some stuff. Now I know the libraries that you want. We can see all those pieces. And, and I, I agree with you, like code review from day one and often, and then it starts to just build that muscle memory where people don't need it, need to refer back to it. Not to say that you don't do it, but they don't need to refer back to it to the same degree. Like you're, you're spot on, Jake. And Ryan, I see there's also an anonymous question that came in too about this topic um, and it was so without functional programming how do you manage the production code base as they grow get back to you <laughs> like from an object oriented if, if that's the way that the people if the people mean that's not necessarily like what we're doing that would be more in our it kind of space where they're building hardcore applications. Our data products for us are more functionally based because our products align with reports. So like building automational reports, uh, dashboards, APIs and models. So functional really works in there uh, from an object oriented space. We're not really doing that. And I don't think that there is much of an intention to go that direction. And in our IT department actually owns that owns that kind of like application building. So I, I wish I could answer, but I would be not doing any justice. I appreciate that though. And uh, 
Zach, I, I see you also had a, a great question around domain knowledge versus coding knowledge. And would love to have you jump in and add that context there. Yeah, sure. So I was just wondering, because you this is going back a couple of minutes now. Uh, you talked about like you have, as you called them, the coding wizards that can do anything. But of course, they then you also have the domain knowledge. Of course, like you're gonna have different people join at different points. You're gonna have people that as you it sounds like you did, you had the domain knowledge and you went into the coding side. But you also have then the people that are coding side and going, actually, I'd like to do something to do you do, I believe it's healthcare. I'd like to go into healthcare as my domain focus, but I'm I already know lots of code. I was wondering, first of all, like just a general question and uh, what do you think is easier to start with? Do you think it's easier to teach them domain knowledge or to teach them the coding? And then the second part of the question was, if someone's a coding expert, do you make sure that like they're having, I don't know how often you have meetings with between teams, but do you make sure like they're working almost 100% of the time with a domain knowledge expert to ensure that the, all the data is in the right direction? You've got some really deep questions there, and I love it. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna tackle your first piece, and then I'm gonna tackle your second one. From, from the from the first piece, I'm gonna do the classic. It depends. It totally depends because the type of person, right? So I think we in our in in our if I can call us sphere data science sphere like in in our in our sector, either people push it on us or we do it outside. We think unicorns exist. And everyone's looking for a data science unicorn. And, and I love them. I've met two in my life, but I actually don't think they exist. I think unicorns are just on my kids TV shows and some of his stuffed animals upstairs. So why I say that, and I, I like to try to be a little bit uh, funny, whether or not I am, that's different, is a unicorn really is someone who has got all that domain knowledge and all that technical stuff thrown together. And that technical stuff can be multiple technical pieces, right? And then you have communications if you choose to put it in there or not. So it kind of depends. So why I'm saying that is through some experience, we in previous roles at the city of Toronto, like in our open data team, we were trying to hire unicorns. Who does want a unicorn factory? Like it should just work. But if you look at sports, most of the amazing teams don't have all the best players. They just don't. It takes like a whole kind of well-rounded kind of look at it. So we, we were striking out on finding some people. And, I, and it was because we were looking for a unicorn to do a role that didn't require it. So there are different personality types. There are people who are like, I'm not interested. I'm not interested in any of that. So why would we like knock them out? So it depends. If you are a certain type of personality that is either one side or the other, that's really, if we can just say like A or B, really A business, I guess we should say that B because it starts with business, really B like a business person and A more technical. I don't think you can really switch it. It, it, it'll be a bit of a, of a tough haul. And, and even if you force it on, maybe they're not going to be interested and they might and now in the great migration, they, they would be a candidate to leave. Um, from the other standpoint, how can you do it? I think you, I think it is, depends on your tech stack and the type of person. So I started to try to learn to code 2003 when I went to college and it was VB. And it just didn't hit me. It just didn't work. And then I tried to do Python and then I tried to do C. It just didn't work with the style. So I think it really depends on the technical piece that it is and how you learn. So that's why I say it depends. Um, SQL is what got me into being able to do things through a code base piece and believe it or not, MS-DOS and doing bash scripts <laughs> to just like line by line kind of do stuff. It got me into that thought pattern. And then with uh, coming into R and the approach of the tidy, I was like, oh, you're thinking of it from a data perspective. It was in an easy transition for me. So it depends on what that tech direction, that coding direction is. It's going to be easier or not easier for certain styles of people. But business is the same thing. If you're not interested in that business and that domain, I don't think you'll ever teach anybody it, right? Like if, if you're not it, um, I think how you need to do it 
is make it interesting and analogies to people. Like that's has how the approaches that I've done things. And then like, I, I roll back to some stuff that people have told me over the years, like explain it like you're talking to your grandmother. My grandmother's 88 and she has no idea what any of this is. I was doing GIS and my mom and my sister, and my grandmother for a hundred years said, Oh, he's doing GPS stuff. Like they don't get it. Right. So you need to break it in. I think with certain languages from a tech coding perspective, it's probably a bit easier to teach elements and levels of that than it is over domain knowledge because domain knowledge is experience and exposure and, and that's time-based. So that would be my long-winded answer to the first piece. And if you can help me, the second one, what was, that was, um, it was about, uh, you have those coding experts and oh. do you enforce them to work with domain experts more to ensure that fact that the data they're looking for is how it's meant to go rather than go on a tangent as lots of data people, or I know, go on a tangent if I'm not making sure if someone's got put me on focus. Yeah. Again, it depends. I would say I don't like to force anything on anyone and holding, having people hold hands together can be counterproductive at certain points. So for me, having kind of sprints and team sessions is really good. Um, the coder doesn't need to be at a design session. They don't need to be there when they're talking to the business and trying to figure out what it is, what's the story. But in that build, I think it's really good. And this is where we're seeing in data science, almost a new position, the translator, the universal translator between thing is becoming extremely important. Um, but I don't think that they work in isolation. I really do not think that they work in isolation. I think you understand if that supreme coder wizard if they have an interest in learning the business, then yeah, have them come in. So we hired a, a person this year and he's interested in doing that. But let's do baby steps. Let's get that person like understanding our business and how we're doing approaches and then bring them in with good clients, with good projects so that it's not like, oh my gosh, meeting by paralysis. So I don't think it's an absolute requirement, um, but I think it is good to have cross-pollination because different thought patterns there's diversity. There's diversity of thought. And I think that's a really good approach. And from a business, talking to the business, having that approach, like, oh, I, what you're trying to do, we can automate that or we can make it efficient. And having someone who's literally going to do it brings street cred to the whole project and the purpose. Like, if you could get that to me, I can shave three weeks off of this project. So I think there are some business benefits, those domain benefits of having a, a coder wizard there but not all the time. I don't think it has to be like a Velcro buddy, buddy kind of um, sitting there together. If, if that helps out. Yeah, that's really good. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Ryan. And Isabella, I see you had a, a question earlier as well, and I'd love to pass the mic over to you. Sure. Uh, thanks so much. My question is also about collaboration, uh, specifically around code review. So yeah. often, like, especially if somebody is very good at code review, like they get tagged for code review each and every time, and it stops being kind of a team activity. And it's, it's like, oh, that's a code review person. And so I'm just wondering, like, how do you prioritize, you know, making sure, well, first of all, do you prioritize making sure that doesn't happen and recognizing that kind of like additional work that folks are doing when they're doing code review and things like that? Yeah, that's a really hard thing, isn't it? Eh? Like we, we tend to think that superstars should be available for everything. And, and I'm going to approach it maybe a little different than like, than you, uh, you phrased it. Like a superstar, that, that coding wizard, they're going to be able to review everything, but their time has a different value prop. I'm not saying their individual hour to hour is more valuable, but their output potential in that hour is, can be so much higher than, than others. So how do you use it efficiently? I think it depends on where you are in your organization. And I don't mean positionally. I mean, are you early days? Do you have three people or are you a large team that has a, a few other things? So if you're early days and you're just starting all people on deck, <laughs> like, like, unfortunately you're, you've got to use the people as you have. And if that superstar, that, that wizard has a great personality, the learning opportunity is extremely valuable. So, so early on days, I think 
we it's hard to prioritize. But as you start getting into pieces, this is where I start leaning back. I'm sorry, I'm not a harper of it, but that TRL, how long is far along is your product? Like where is it? Are you starting to get into like beta release? Are you starting to get into like um, commercialization? Are you putting it into operations? Yeah, you probably won't have a really good set of eyes there. Or is it the first time that you've built something of that nature? Like this is your first machine learning model. Like, yeah, you probably want to have it there so you don't waste a bunch of time to get it there for the code. Like if you would have just told me at the very beginning, I'm so I think there is a little bit of that difference. So as always, classically, it depends. But if, if I were to summarize, it depends on like if you have a small team, I don't know if you can really prioritize it too, too easily because I've yet to find an organization like how many uh, code reviewers do you want on your team? Like you don't hire just for that, right? There's multiple hats. So when it's small, we all have to wear a little bit of hats. I think what we do is we prioritize capabilities and like importance. So, you know, if I go back to my early days when I was learning, um, it's like, how do I bring in more than one CSV at the same time? Right? Like, how do I do that? How do I like get that from like a folder? Probably shouldn't go talk to the, the lead data scientist to figure that out. Is there somebody else in there that's done it one time, right? Like those kinds of things. So I think it really depends on the level of code in, in that piece. Um, that's kind of where I would look at it and, and try in your own kind of thought pattern to break out the development cycle into like kind of groups and maybe not have people jump more than a few groups at a time, right? So if you have four levels of group is like, First, first time thoughts, like, okay, it's in the POC, MVP, and product. Your lead person probably doesn't need to code review the design. Or maybe they just kind of review the concept, but like, if that helps, there's no perfect silver bullet like to do this, unfortunately. Um, but I, I would say that some people's capability productivity has more value than others. So you want to use those times accordingly. And, you know, if it's not for production, my mindset goes like, I'm sorry, it's lower down in the priority chain. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Isabella. And it was just kind of making me think also, like we have this Slack channel internal at our studio where you could ask questions about R. Um, and I wonder if like that's helpful for people too, because you don't have to go like ask that question over and over again or like people with answers. Yeah, I think that's really helpful. Like our team isn't so much like a, an IME kind of team. That's just not who we are. But my previous place I was at, we were absolutely all over Slack. And there was a lot of that. It's like, hey, this isn't working. Someone just take a peek at it. That's great. I think one of the things, I'm sorry, I'm going to do a plug here. Like it's not too much of a slight. We as a society, a uh, sector, we got to change the way that we respond in forms and how we respond to questions, right? Like, if you are a wizard, you're rare. <laughs> like, you're, like, you are special. Not everyone's there. So, like, being able to write things out so that makes more of that, like, iterative kind of step-by-step -step process of how you're coding is really gonna help people in the long run and you as a wizard to not waste as much time like answering these types of questions, right? So if someone's saying like, how do I do a group by? Don't put a whole bunch of other non nonsense in there that's not answering their specific question because on a learning curve, we're trying to solve a single problem that's bugging me today, not, and this goes back into like some of the previous questions, like how do I not build something that, that's that piece? So I think we, we can do a better job documenting answers and responses so that they're more usable and iterative to build, right? So if someone asks like an answer for one plus one, don't teach them calculus. Hey. Sorry, Jake, I'm gonna just hop in real quick. It's more of a comment and adding on to what Rachel and Brian, your response. Isn't this really about getting people or teaching people to ask better questions and be more thoughtful in what they ask of the world? Absolutely. I think there's a mix though. There is a little bit of a mix in that because there is elitist syndrome, 
right? Like there is a piece like I had to struggle. Like I started my PhD and there were so many things like, hey, that's that's the struggle of the PhD I had to do. I'm like, okay, yeah, well, then that mentality, we used to do a lot of things in the world that we don't do anymore. But yeah, people need to take some time to check. You're not the only person to ever ask this question in your, in your life. I'm sorry, there are very few questions in the world that have never been thought of, right? So to your point, yeah, we have to ask better questions. I think reproducibility, and this is like the, the hot buzzword, right, in, in our industry, um, being able to put that out so that people can explore into it is really important, but also breaking things down into the appropriate response, right? Not to like flex off and use, if we use forms as an example, as a social media post to show how awesome you are at something. Yeah. It's not the place. It's like a library. You wouldn't write in the back of the library on the card. I read this book in six hours. Well, I read it in three and a half. Like, I don't care. I'm reading the book. It's going to take me six months because I have other things going on in my life. I don't think like that. So when those response rates, like, I don't, I think we can do a better job to get everyone up. We want everyone there. Like, that's what we want as a community. We want everyone there solving problems, helping and, and making the world a better place. And, and if, if the, cost of the ticket to the party is too much we're going to exclude people but yeah people have to ask better questions 100 yeah. percent, like you do jake I, I saw you had something to add to this as well about your own team's process yeah i think it's a great question like how do you not overwhelm um your your more like senior senior analyst and I, I, I think that like a second pair of eyes is always good, even if it's a newer person. A newer person maybe just recently went through our onboarding and knew some of our standards better um, than someone who's been here a long time and our standards have changed and they maybe haven't like upgraded with it. Um, so I always think a second pair of eyes is good. Even if the code is really complicated, like it kind of helps us understand if it's annotated well and if like the variable names are intuitive, like just a second pair of eyes, I just think always helps. And then you can pass it off if you get stuck. If there's really a section you're like, I'm not sure, let me pass it off to, to someone who I think is going to know, like now they're using some per functions and, you know, maybe uh, there's only a, a small group of folks that uh, on our team who are comfortable with per. Um, so it's like, all right, well, maybe I'll pass that section off to them. Um, and then again, keeping the, the, the code review um, small. So the pull request can be large, but uh, the request for code review should should be like smaller sections um, so that it's easier to, to review. Um, so those are just some of the suggestions I, I had um, from, from my team. Thanks, Jake. That's awesome. Thanks, Jake. Um, I'd love to ask a question that might shift gears a little bit, but um, I I mean, I've realized just talking to everybody the past few months that hiring is extremely hard right now. And I know we talked a little bit about this too, but like building up the, not only the culture, but the way that people externally who don't understand your company see that data science environment and like get excited yeah. by it. And I'm just wondering if you're not like one of the like top tech firms, like how do you do that to get people excited about potential opportunities? Rachel, that is such an awesome question. And I, I can imagine I'm not the only person struggling or, or challenged by that, right? Like we thankfully live in an awesome sector and time, right? Like for us as individuals, you know, we've got a bit of that golden ticket, but for like building organizations, it's challenging, right? We know of, as you said, those big tech firms of thought, the stuff that goes to it and, the, and then location has a thing, right? Like, Canada being in the shadow of the United States, like there's a little bit of that too, right? Like the poll. When I joined Green Shield, I only knew about them because we had healthcare coverage through them before. So I was aware of some of the stuff that they were doing. Um, so some of those other industries, similarly to us, is really lower down and the pre-notions and preconceptions of what that means, like insurance or banking or retail, like some of those other sectors that you know, you don't think of startup or Silicon Valley or like big data, like those kinds of pieces. It's a challenge. So how do how do we do it? How did how have I done it? What are some approaches that we're thinking of? LinkedIn, first off, be shameless. 
<laughs> like take as many people as possible. Um, I think being a bit edgy and fun, knowing your audience is a bit different rather than we currently have an opportunity. Like, no, like get to like people have so much limited time in their day. They want to know what you're really going to be like. Like what, what's it going to be like? That's where we're at today, right? There's a, a, a plethora of opportunities. Um, so what are some of the things that people are really interested in? What are the problems that you're working on? Like, that's really interesting. A lot of people like to know the tech stack. Like, hey, like, am I going to be working on something I'm comfortable with? I'm no longer interested in, or, oh, that's new. I want to be involved with it. So those are some of the pieces that, that we've used as an approach. Um, I think being honest and open is like, hey, we're trying to build stuff and you're going to have a chance to shape it and, and like organize it and like put your thumbprint or your flavor on it. Those are some really fun catch pieces to do just for your traditional kind of like social media, like networking parts. Where we're going, and, and, and I know you and I know where I'm going with what I'm about to say, um, where, where we're going is actually making a concerted effort to advertise and advertise in the sense of giving back to the community. So putting out our own analytical blog posts or putting things out on our pubs, putting out media pieces more regular to show like, we're doing some fun stuff. Yeah, we are not Google and we don't profess or claim to be, but there's only a couple of those types of places in the world, right? So this is the kind of things that we're looking at and putting that out more regularly and contributing to open source. Uh, so that people can kind of see ahead of time and then it pops up on the radar. Uh, some of the, the other things that other organizations and in, in, in my days in municipal government go there is changing the titles so that they just pop up on people's searches, right? Like that, those are some pieces like, yeah, you may want to use them that way and you bake it in, but people don't necessarily read all the requirements from a search pattern. So, so those would be some pieces, Rachel, if we want to touch and go further, I would be more, more than happy. Well, that, that's super helpful. I, I can't wait to also share that, <laughs> that snippet with people too. Um, I'm curious from everyone else on the call too, if there's other things that have worked for you or even specific challenges that you're facing right now with hiring. I'm not hiring, but as someone that's looking to get into it, uh, we briefly talked about it in the chat last time. Uh, I'm 22. I'm looking to get into data science sector. And therefore, I look at all these jobs, especially on LinkedIn, where I go, uh, I'm going to be stereotypical about myself. I'm white. I'm privileged. I went to a very good school. And therefore, I see these job applications and posts. And I go, I don't care. I'm going to apply anyway. What's the worst? They're going to say no. Uh, or don't respond to probably as even worse these days. Uh, but so I just apply anyway. But it's found that, and studies have shown that that hinders a lot of people, uh, especially minorities and uh, people coming from less fortunate backgrounds in applying. Do you think hate, generally HR's lack of knowledge about data science sector hinders hiring too much? And how do you think that's gonna, that could be a solution to that? Yeah, um, I, Zach, I could go into this for hours. My sister's in HR, so we talk about this all the time. Uh, generally, when I join an organization, some of the first people I try to make best friends with are the HR people. Like that's just my approach because if you wanna get stuff done, you need, they need to be your best friends. Um, they don't know. And they're under the gun for so many different things. Hiring is only generally one element of, of the plethora of HR stuff that goes on. So I would say, yeah, they're not sure. They're aware of it. They are very aware of the organization. They know how, or sorry, the sector, how challenging it is. Um, so what I've done for them is, you know what? I'm going to take some of those costs on for you. Send me all of them. I don't care if there's 500 applicants. Send me every single one of them. I will screen with you and I'll give you my first view and we'll put some stuff over and we'll look at it that way because reading between the lines is sometimes challenging. Right. And then also, you know, yeah, like they can literally see a language or like keyword searches, but within context, it may mean nothing. Or if it's like, Hey, I did a Udemy course for three hours in this, that doesn't mean you're screened in. Right. Like, so, so there's some of those pieces. So I would say they're critically, I think they're critically challenged. 
um, how, how I've gone about it is I've taken the cost on to do the, the recruiting myself. I've also, oh, I hope they're not listening, um, not necessarily followed some of the requirements that I'm supposed to, i.e. education. I personally don't care how you got there because um, it would be very hypocritical of myself. Uh, I, don't, I didn't follow that path. I think we live in a world where there isn't a defined path and people can get there in lots of different ways. So there's a lot of other pieces that we do to, to screen people in and look at it. Um, one of my favorite teams that, that I've ever worked on was at the city of Open Data. And, and for those of you who haven't watched Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, the 1960 stop motion one, watch it afterwards because this comment that I'm about to say will make more sense. We were the island of misfit toys. <laughs> we were nowhere close to your stereotypical superstar team, but boy, oh boy, did we get a lot of stuff done. And typical HR people wouldn't be able to find those meshes and nuances of how the jigsaw puzzle of success would go together. So I think sharing some of those costs as in like work and screening is really behooves us as uh, people who are building teams to work with HR that way. How would we get there? I think it goes back a bit of your question earlier, Zach, is a tech person who wants to make a career change and go into that field and bring that domain knowledge in, but HR is somewhat like us, has some rigid requirements to be able to get in because there's apps and laws and other pieces. I think it's going to be a challenge for us for a decade more. Thank you very much. No problem. I see a lot of great comments in the chat right now. And Sep, I see you just raise your hand if you want to jump in first. Yeah, if you don't mind. Um, I was just going to kind of add on to that. There's a whole spectrum of companies, Zach, and for other people. Um, and it kind of depends on your bandwidth too. Like I think at prior companies, I didn't really have the bandwidth to go through all the applications primarily because the company is so large, right? When it's like 10,000 plus employees, they have very kind of strict ways with how they handle applications and, and things of that nature. And it was actually quite a struggle uh, because as much as I would try to explain to the recruiter to filter these things, there was always the computer that's always in front that allows some of these applications to get through because people are just throwing in a bunch of keywords and the recruiter then sees it and then passes it along to you. And I'm like, this doesn't mean anything to me. I can't do anything with this. So, um, you know, my recommendation, especially if you're trying to break in to the, to the area is be very specific about what it is that you want to do, what area you want to work in and reach out to those people that you find interesting on LinkedIn or whatnot, and just send them a message asking just to chat with them. Because a lot of times you find that there may be a, a match in personality or in education. And then that allows you to kind of circumvent this kind of somewhat broken process with larger companies. Um, so that just wanted to kind of put those two cents out there. That's awesome. And then just to add on to that, if there's not a fit with the person you reach out to, generally they have a network and we always try to help each other out. So we'll point people in other directions as well. So I think it's always, that's a great point to, play, to, to just reach out. Yeah, I'll definitely do that. Thank you. I'm going to chime in and pile on to, to everything Sep said, uh, especially at larger companies, like a good strategy is hit me up on LinkedIn. Our recruiting process isn't always as robust as you you might think it is. Yeah. Mike, I, I see you had a great point in the chat as well. If you'd love to, if you'd like to jump in and, and add that. Hi, yeah. Um I I'm starting to think about this kind of process as well. And we had at, a, at my company, we had talked about the potential for growing data scientists, you know, so bringing in people who kind of demonstrate the right kind of enthusiasm, the right kind of data focus and, and analytical thinking, maybe not necessarily the tech skills and almost doing an apprenticeship and saying, you know, we realize that you don't know everything yet. That's cool. You know, but we'll, we'll show you how. And, you know, after a, a period, if you realize that it's not for you, that's great. You know, just we, we'll, we'll send you on your way with a pat on the back. But if you find that you love it, then great, carry on. Um, and I wonder whether that's a more sustainable model than, you know, continuing to hunt for the unicorns. Yeah. Um, 
I, I promise I'll be quick I'll, and add and then let others too. I think that's how we're going to see stuff going. And, and we're looking at doing that very similarly at uh, Green Shell ourselves, uh, do a little company plug, but we're doing transformations and you're seeing that and we saw it in other places, this operational model, like operating model, and I know not all organizations do that, but the hub and spoke, you may have your core place that is the core, but now starting to put people in other organizations that are data focused. Places know that we need to do this, we need to transition, right? So putting that in there and having a strong educational kind of mentorship piece, I think is how we will grow it. Um, and just being really realistic on, we're not trying to grow unicorns. We're trying to grow people that can solve problems that are valuable to our business. I think it's like, if we know going into that, it's like, you're not gonna come out a unicorn and we don't expect you to be that, then I think that model is gonna work. Like superb. And Ryan, I'd love to just also have you share the roles that you're hiring for too. And I realized there was a question that I missed earlier, if all of the roles would be for people in Canada um, or yeah. the US as well. uh, So we have a hybrid working model. I think we're Canadian only focus. I'd have to check. And I'm not sure if that has to do with like taxation kind of purposes. Like I'm not sure we're a Canadian company, but we definitely have American clients. Like I know that. So I would say apply anyways, like if you're interested, we currently have two for our data engineering piece. Um, what does that mean? It's like your data pipelines, uh, building access points, APIs, they'll always be working with like analytical kind of pieces, but really shaping up and building that kind of that whole practice. Cause it, it you know, it's missing in a lot of organizations. So we're, we're focusing there. We have more that are becoming out soon in that true data science. And this is where that split is. So for those of you who love that word and think that's you, we won't be asking you to do data cleaning. That's the data engineering. You're going to be focusing on doing analytics and building models. And then where we're going to be looking into the new year a little bit more is like that more machine learning engineer. So you as a data scientist can take it to a certain level and then hand it off into a, like a machine learning engineering person to harden it up. So we're really trying to build things kind of, I don't want to say siloed, but more focused on to like your skill sets and your interests and putting it there. And then also, I'm a firm believer of putting in more um, starting out roles, like in that analyst level, so people can grow up. And I'm trying to start pushing into like that data storyteller, data journalist, product analyst that's doing the communication and starting to put that in there uh, instead of our typical BA business analyst. So, so those are some of the things that we're doing. We're, we have a really big initiative uh, for analytics in 2022 to 2025. So keep your eyes on us. <laughs> You'll see a lot. And if you follow me on LinkedIn, I'm going to bug you because you're going to see a lot of stuff coming up. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. And oh, I know geez. a few people have to drop because we just went over <laughs> the, the hour mark. Um, so I do want to say thank you so much to everybody for being a part of this community and, and building the data science hangout this year. This has really turned into my favorite part of the week, um, being able to hang out with you all. So thank you. And wishing everybody happy holiday and a happy new year. I'm looking forward to seeing you all back on, on January 6th. Um, I definitely want to stay on and, and ask a few other questions if you have a few more minutes, Ryan. But I Yeah, I totally do. I actually am on a day off, so I've got hours oh. left. Well, thank you for joining us on your day no off. Worries. Yeah, no, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. Awesome. Well, also, I, I shared a feedback form as well in the chat for if anyone wants to take a look at that and give feedback or suggestions for next year, as well as our, our speaker lineup. But um, Peter, I saw you also put a great question in the chat when we were talking about hiring, um, around hiring in the public sector. Would you wanna jump in there? And Peter, I, could, I can read it. And if you wanna ju add, just add more context, feel free to, to jump in too. But the question was, um, one issue we have in the public sector is recruiting when our hiring process is so slow. It makes us less competitive and drawing in people actively seeking a position. Just interested in any thoughts on that? Oh my gosh, Peter, that was five years for me at the city of Toronto. Like creating a role took two years. So like I get it and like people told me 
you got a, a job filled in six months. Like how, how were you able to do that so fast? And, and I was able to start doing it in three and they're like, how, how does it work? Like, how are you doing that? And not say that we did it all the time. Uh, I had many jobs that went to like three rounds. Like it's extremely slow. So how do we do the competitiveness? One thing that I will put out there, I was lucky city of Toronto is a big name, right? Like we, we are a target. Uh, people, we have, we have a brand associated to it. So that did help us. Like I will say that, that, that was a positive thing that helped us early on. It was hard is extremely hard. And, and what I learned in order, where we start to get more qualified applicants, if you want to say it that way, more interest from people that you would not expect. Um, and then just more applicants was that advertising like that, like what, what you're doing. Right. So I joined, I joined uh, the city of Toronto uh, midway through my PhD and decided not to finish and went there. And people were like, you're committing suicide. What are you doing? You're going to like a large bureaucracy. And I'm like, I see it differently. <laughs> I see it as an opportunity to make municipal government like it was in the 60s and 70s, where they were doing the cool stuff, where they were doing all the solving of the problems. And I looked at it as, hey, I, I joined as a manager, uh, as title, and I, I'm not a title person, but it had a team of like 30 people. That means I have an operating budget. How is that any different than having a grad program? I didn't have to recruit any grad students. I had people there and I had guaranteed funding. I didn't have to write things. So if you take a look at it a little bit differently and you play within your rules and, and, and I kind of throw the rules out in the municipal government, Peter, one thing that I would say is <laughs> get to know your um, severance package policy really well, because you'll realize that it takes them a long time to get you out. And in the public sector, delivery trumps everything. So what we did is we asked for forgiveness and didn't ask for permission, right? So we started to just take over social media kind of stuff and putting things out, talking about what we specifically were doing, what it's going to be like to come there. And then we delivered and we delivered quickly and we de didn't deliver perfectly. And there's that, that has a bit of a purpose. Uh, one, because it, it's, it's pragmatic. It's impossible to deliver perfectly, but people see things quicker and they see things often. And then they also start to dispel this kind of preconceived conception of like bureaucracy and slow and boring and things like that. And we started to get out and speak. We would go to events and it didn't have to be me. It could be people on the team and go out. Like people will resonate and talk about stuff and, and put the word out there. And then joining into the open source community and like really pushing that on the inside and doing stuff got people to be like, oh, government's doing some kind of cool stuff here. Like I'm interested in that. And then the thing that we always have that uh, private sector net doesn't have all the time is we're doing stuff that helps society. And there are certain elements of people who really look for that and really want to align themselves. And we actually had a ton of people who were leaving the big five large tech companies who are like, I made a lot of money, but I didn't do a lot of good for what they were thinking. I'm not saying that they didn't do good, but from what they were saying is I didn't do anything that was helping what they, they envisioned for values in their societal kind of lens and, and what's important to them. So they wanted to transition into that. So by making that just known in your postings and like the way that you share it out there and having like ab advertising, like your social media presence, like this is what we're going to do. And this is what we stand for. That attracts people that allows people like, okay, I'm going to go make a difference. And this is how I can see I, that I'm going to do it. And these are the things that are going to do it. I'm going to, um, I'm going to wait. It's going to be worth it. It's totally going to be worth it to wait. And that's okay. Um, the other shameless thing, Peter, and, and I'm, I'm already saying this now because I'm no longer a public employee. Oh, I stalked people. <laughs> I stalked people. My, my buddy, uh, Matt Tenney, I straight up stalked him. And, and like we hired him he was our first true data scientist at the city of Toronto. I stalked him and stalked him and stalked him uh, online and pulled him away from like Esri Canada. So it was something in another municipality. He was looking at other things. So if you're on there, Matt, if you hear this, haha, uh, remember those days back in 2017. Um, those are some of the pushes that we use. And I was okay with it because I knew what it, how long it was going to take and how much it was going to cost him to fire me. 
So that's what I mean by the sevens package. So like you have some really good trump cards that you can play in public sector, but it's hard. Mm -hmm really hard. Thank you. That's very helpful because I feel like we're really trying to do something very similar and develop capacity in house, uh, you know, and, and, and do more with our data. Uh, and I think we are doing some interesting things and we have some interesting things on the horizon. Um, but I've, I've just found in, you know, many different hiring cycles, not just for data positions, but like by the time we get around to hiring somebody, we've lost half of our interview panel uh, because they yep. found other positions. So, um, I, I, I like this idea of having, you know, because three to six months, that is kind of the window, but that's too long for somebody who yes. is looking for a position now. And yep. uh, so I, I appreciate some of the, the strategies that we can kind of wrap around that. Thank you. No problem. The other thing that we did because we weren't able to hire because of like the talent was just so hard or waiting for budget cycles to come through to create new, new positions. We did something really bold. We took an entire team who were 55 to 63 years old and sent them to school for two months and straight up sent them out. So that you're going to school, but it was York University, so I'll give a plug to them. They did a great job. And they were in school for five days a week to re-educate them and they went through a whole data science program kind of piece. It was a tough sell. Uh, that means that I, I and a few other people took on those costs of doing some of the jobs, like organizing, working with the business to say, we're going to be a little bit of a lull on our delivery, but here's what you're going to get on the end. So that might help you as a different strategy as well of um, tooling up if you can't recruit like as a piece, because let's, let's be honest, side of your desk education is really hard at the beginning for people. I think that's a great way to top up and improve when you already have that confidence in those capabilities, those tool sets in your in your toolbox, right? You might have a hammer and a screwdriver, but after a while you start needing other tools. And uh, that's easier when you have those bases. So I'm not sure if that's something of interest, Peter, but we found it really helpful and Boy, were those individuals super grateful. And they went from low performers to high performers overnight. And it sparked other people in the in the team and the organization organization like, I want to do that too. And it just it starts to change the culture of like what's acceptable. Because output sells. Mubanga, I see you have your hand raised as well and love to turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, Rachel. I just have a quick question, uh, Ryan. What O'Reilly book is there on your shelf? What <laughs> book, Riley? Oh, man. <laughs> so, do you want to go chronologically, alphabetical, or just off the top? I, I was interested in the one that was on the far right, the, the white O'Reilly book. Th this one? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's what it off. Yeah, that's my most recent read. This is how it all began. Uh, this is what I used in grad school. So if you're a qualitative geographer, this was really helpful. Um, I'll be honest, this was over. This one was over my head a lot. And then ggplot, I still have to look up the syntax. I read this one on the TTC on the subway. It was just like a long commute. Awesome book. This is really well done. Super helpful because this is like where I'm starting to progress now is to improve access for people so they don't need to know everything. They can just access through a package. And then for my geo friends, it doesn't get any better than this. Thank you, Ryan. You're reminding me that we talked about maybe having a book club at some point. <laughs> Um, one other question that I see that we have remaining, and if there's any others that I maybe missed in the chat, please jump in. But um, Bruno, I see you had a, a great question on, um, well, I won't summarize. I'll, I'll turn it over to you. All right. Ryan, I really like uh, the way you speak, how you interpret the business world. How did you develop okay. such interesting views around business and people interaction? Do you have mentors? Oh. Uh, was it trial and error? Well, <laughs> uh, uh, I, I, believe it or not, I don't take compliments very well. So that's really flattering and hard for me to like uh, digest. So thank you so much, Bruno. If, if I reflect back, um, 
trial and tribulation, I don't have like your normal progressional path through things. I moved around a whole bunch, like my whole life. I literally have moved 50 times in my life. So it's been forcing me to have to speak. So I think early on, if I think about it, that, that really did it. Another thing for me, I had an early on job where I gave gondola tours. And it, I was stuck in a gondola with 50 people and had to talk to them. And a lot of times a gondola would get stuck over a river and we could be there for 20 minutes. So it would really force you to talk. Um, I would say what truly helped me uh, transition into the speaking is my love of movies and trying to break things down into a movie. I'm very visual, but movies tell a story and and people love stories. So if, if you can kind of remove the jargon for a bit, and, and I do pick that word because a lot of business leaders think like, oh, here we go, jargon, they're coming in with jargon again, is, is, is to remove that and, and be vulnerable and allow people to be part of your story and, and, and reward them. So telling them and bringing them involved and helping them be part of it. So, so I think following the script of like some of your favorite movies or just like how I, how I've done it. It's like, let, let's be animated. I don't mind being silly. Hence why I'm wearing what I'm wearing. Like I have no problem with it. Um, if, if through my progression is if we keep going, some of the pieces that, that go along is truly being vulnerable. And then, then my wife, um, she's my sounding board. Prior prior to that, I had a great friend that I worked with, Mike, at Sam Warren, and we were doing geo stuff, and we were building products, and he's like, I'm a designer, I draw. And so I would use him as a sounding board. If Mike didn't get it, no one would. So like having those kinds of pieces, uh, so so using my wife, like, does this make sense? Like, she's a teacher, and she's in, she like, teaches uh, elementary school, school students, so nothing in this space. So... She's like, yeah, I get it. Is this what it is? I'm like, okay, changing the approach. And then I went into like analogies. So I think having kind of a dynamic kind of way about stuff and trying to understand your audience in somewhat into groups and what is really important for them. So some people have a uh, true importance on just pure profit. Like, okay, like I'm going to use profit kind of directions of my story. Some people are about like, no, no, no. How's the culture and the feel? And like, so you kind of mitigate and you swing around. Uh, a friend of mine told me and I took offense to it right away. And then I was like, oh, wait, no, that's, that's not offensive. You're a chameleon, right? And it's funny that I bring that up. I, my son was asking me, what's a chameleon? I'm like, oh, how do I explain that to a four-year-old? Like it's a lizard that changes color within their environment. They adapt. And, and I think that's kind of a bit of the essence is adapting to your environment and, and understanding what people value and appreciate. And if you can, if you can somewhat get there on a common level ground, people appreciate that because there are people who want that hardcore tech and they were like, every time you speak it you better be giving me your resume like there are those individuals there and they're always going to be at that level and then there's the far other end of the spectrum of people it's like i'm too afraid to kind of like ask anything that's just not who they are people are somewhere in the middle and most people you know nerd normal distribution <laughs> like most people are kind of somewhere in the middle um we we get off put right it's like are you are you seriously resuming me right now like is that how we're we're doing this conversation so kind of breaking it down so that people can feel like they have something to contribute and like oh i'm a little bit higher than i'm like yes great and they're giving i think doing that and not feeling like i'm not saying you are and like just one of the things that i kind of try to do and i don't do it well all the time is letting people give more than what you are. You facilitate kind of the, the dialogue and let people feel like they're giving. I try to measure success on literally finishing, like delivering, right? So my wife and I are a little bit different. Uh, I like the destination less, more so than the journey. So if it means changing around and having people contribute, that's cool, that's the journey. Like, ah, that's great for me. I love people doing that piece as long as the destination is kind of successful. So that's kind of a bit of my mantra. I, I care less about how we get there, um, but to summarize, 
being goofy, <laughs> like if you're okay with being goofy, uh, laughing a whole bunch, trying to tell a story and breaking it down into like kind of analogies and, and um, understanding your target audience is what I did. Mentorship, no, I'm still, I had a great person, like one individual, but really my mentor's been movies. I just, I just love movies. So just using like, hey, one of the things I, I helped out with a friend, she was uh, really scared for an interview. I'm like, one of the ones that I use all the time. So here's a movie plug uh, of my approach is Eight Mile with Eminem, right? So if, for those of you who have watched it, you're going to know what I'm about to say. For those of you who don't, uh, fast forward all the way to the last half an hour of the movie. I try to do everything like mom spaghetti, the last rap battle. I take away all their ammunition and just kind of like put it out there at the beginning, right? Is you just try to own it and hey, yeah, you're right. I don't know anything, but can we talk about what we need to do instead? So you just remove all the barriers at the beginning and just totally be funny about it. And if people aren't laughing, it's like, great. Now I know I don't want to work with you. I love that you just referenced eight mile. I said in the chat when we make, so we are making this data science hangout site where you can see all the recordings and resources. So I might have to add that to the recommendation. <laughs> I think, I think that's actually a great point though, that Ryan's and uh, it's really bad that I forgot to speak is from last week's name, but it's about, yeah, it's about like understanding that we're not perfect and it's going, yes, I know I can't do this now, but you give me the time. I'm going to be, I'm dedicated enough to learn this and I will get there. And I think that's one of the biggest skills uh, that showing that you are vulnerable, showing you're not perfect. And it comes across like Ryan is not deliberately doing this, but he's saying that he doesn't know everything and even, oh, you can hear my dogs, sorry about this. But like, oh no, I love dogs, all good, brother. Uh, but yeah, it's that vulnerability and knowing that you're not perfect, and that's came across a lot, which has been really well, good. thanks, like, to be, like, openly honest, I have a severe case of inferiority complex. Like, in this space, like, absolutely huge because of my my history, like how I got here, right? So so I think owning it is like really helpful because then no one can use it against you. Like, yeah, you're right. I came from rec. I'm better at leading you on a canoe trip <laughs> than I am at writing APIs. Like I'm totally better at that, but I can also do that too. So do we want to talk about how we can like solve our problems for our customers or our business or our society or like like just like, is that really important? If you want to talk about it, like I'll totally talk about it with you. But like really, like you said, Zach, like owning that, like it's really I think it's what we, we should be doing just societally, but like I don't think this is the our studio philosophical soapbox session. <laughs> no. I love that though. That's that's so helpful for me too. And also we still would love to go on a canoe trip with you all. Oh, yeah. yeah. Once hang COVID's out. over, we'll all go to Canada. Yeah. Yeah, come on. I'd love to take you on a wilderness could you trip. It's awesome. I know we're we're quite a bit over too, but I, I love this this conversation here. And I unfortunately have to go get ready for another meeting. But thank you all so much for, for jumping in here at the end too. And all this conversation is awesome. Bruno, I see you're raising your hand, so I want to make sure that I didn't miss something you're about to say. Oh, you're waving. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah, these have been these have been really good. I just want to say this before you end this. I really do appreciate it. Like, as I said, like, I'm probably the youngest person, most inexperienced, but I'm learning so much every single time. And yeah, learn, learn from others is one of the best things. And yeah. You're not a bug, you're a feature. Yeah. <laughs> Everything you have has got value. Yeah. I don't think of it that way. Thank you so much, Ryan, again, for well, Rachel, I appreciate insights it. for us too. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for providing and allowing me to have this opportunity. It's been awesome. I really like this is awesome. Uh, I was nervous. <laughs> like, I totally have butterflies. I was nervous. Uh, you guys are an amazing community. So uh, thank you. I, I hope it's been okay. Uh, for those of you who would like to continue, I love to chat. As you can tell, uh, I will talk all day long. So uh, I look forward to uh, hopefully continuing this 
relationship uh, with you all in the future. Yeah, this is great, Ryan. And that's a question I forgot to ask you. What is the best way to connect with you? Is it LinkedIn? Yeah, I'm a LinkedIn Twitter kind of person. Uh, okay. I think I'm a little bit too old for Snapchat. I, I think they have an age barrier where they just like kick you off if you sign up. <laughs> Hey, I'm not on Snapchat either. <laughs> yeah, I know that I get addicted to video, so I'm staying away from TikTok. But yeah, like LinkedIn and Twitter are, are to me. I'm pretty simple. I'm Ryan Garnett, 78. You can decide if you want to choose what that number 78 means. Please be friendly. <laughs> uh, and that, that's who I am. Awesome. Thank you so much, Ryan. Have a great yeah, sure. rest of the day, everyone. And happy holidays. Happy New Year. Looking forward to seeing you in 2022.